Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the third lecture in a series on electrical safety issues. These slides were originally prepared by my colleague Steve Kinney for our junior ECE design fundamentals class, but this also can provide a resource for students in capstone design, and this is also very important for my guitar amplification and effects students. Let's talk about grounding. This is particularly important if you have a piece of equipment that's using a metal case. So normally the case is just hanging out. Here we have an example of your wall current driving a load through a fuse. And in general operation, the current goes through here, goes through your load, comes back. And remember it is alternating current, so the current is actually going back and forth. It's not like this is really one directional. But the thing to remember is that there might be some sort of fault in your circuit. A wire might come loose. And if a wire comes loose and then touches that metal case, now the case is energized. And if you touch it, you might be a convenient path to ground. So what you want to make sure is that the current has a low impedance path to ground. So it wants to go through that instead of through you. Now, I'm personally bothered by test equipment that has a metal case. I think if you have a metal chassis, you should ground it, but I also think it would be a good idea to insulate the whole thing, but maybe that's just me. So thinking about your standard three pin wall outlet connector, we have a neutral pin that's the longer connector, a hot pin that's the shorter connector, and then your ground pin. So ideally the neutral and the green are at the same potential. But one thing you never ever want to do is hook the neutral and the ground together at the wall socket. Never do that to solve your grounding problems. That is a terrible idea and you'll violate all kinds of building codes. Now, the neutral and ground are hooked together, but way out at your electrical panel or at your meter or sometimes at the last step down transformer responsible for giving you your 120 volt or whatever but they are not hooked together here. No, no, no. So the reason I emphasize this is I actually was in one of the Georgia Tech ECE laboratories one evening, and there was a bit of a boom sound and a bit of a flash of light. So I wandered over to see if the student required any assistance. And over the course of the discussion, they mentioned that they had hooked the neutral and the ground together to try to solve a grounding issue. I told them to not do that. Usually your device will have a transformer whose job it is to take the voltage out of the wall and step it down for most modern electronics or step it up in the case of a tube amplifier to create the actual voltages that you need. And this is usually then passed through some sort of rectifier and voltage regulator, et cetera, et cetera. Now the capacitors shown here are for filtering. The ones here, if you have them at all, are for filtering radio frequency interference and other electromagnetic interference. And these are very problematic. I'll come back to these capacitors a little bit later. Now, ideally, no current is flowing through the ground wire. If you have current flowing through the ground wire, it means that something's gone wrong. And hopefully that thing going wrong may be detected by a ground fault circuit interrupt device. So these are basically the wall sockets you'll see that have little buttons on them. And if they trip, then you can press the little button and reset it. So you'll see these in bathrooms and in kitchens. And the general idea here is that it's looking for situations where the neutral and the hot wire have differing amounts of current flowing through them. Because if that's different, it means that there's some current flowing elsewhere which hopefully is through a ground wire, but it might be through you. And I have to confess, this is something I actually didn't understand until I learned this from my colleague, Steve Kinney. I had always assumed that by the name GFCI with the G standing for ground, that these things actually detected current in the ground wire to detect a failure state. But you can't imagine failure states where there's current going where it's not supposed to and it's not actually going through the ground wire, but finding some other path. So this is how they do it. And I find it pretty impressive that they can do this without actually interrupting the wires themselves.
Now, if you are in a situation where you need to have some filtering on the AC side of the transformer, you want to use a safety capacitor. The capacitors that are connected to the chassis, for those you would want to choose a class Y capacitor. These are guaranteed, well, with a certain probability to fail as an open circuit if they fail at all. You certainly don't want to have a capacitor that's going from the hot to ground fail as a short because suddenly your chassis is tied to the hot and now your chassis is energized. And if you touch it and you have another path to ground, then you will get an electric shock. We'll talk about this issue a little bit in the next lecture when we discuss the death capacitor. Now, sometimes people will also put some filtering capacitors between the hot and the neutral. For that, they'll use something called a class X capacitor. And this is a little strange. This is guaranteed, well, with a certain probability to fail as a short, which seems like an odd thing to do, except this is designed to be used alongside a fuse. So hopefully the short will cause the fuse to blow. Now, something that I consider to be a great travesty is that in building wiring, the black wire is hot and the white wire is neutral. And I consider this a horrible convention because in your typical electrical engineering laboratory, black usually indicates ground and you usually use something like red to indicate the voltage. Sometimes the ground wire itself will be bare. Sometimes they'll use green, but be really careful when wiring your house if you're an electrical engineer. I know somebody who wired some portions of their house thinking that black was neutral. So when they turned off the light switch, they were switching off the neutral instead of the hot. Very disconcerting. So be careful with that kind of thing. Cables subject to mechanical stresses can fray and potentially lead to a hazard where you have exposed wires or shorts within the cable itself. There's a variety of strain relief kind of devices that can help with this. In terms of wire itself, solid wire can be good for situations where the wire isn't going to move, but in any case where the wire might be moving, you probably want to go with stranded wire. If you, for some reason, find yourself fascinated about the different kinds of materials that people make cables out of, you can pause the video here and stare at this slide for a while. Sometimes you have a high voltage that you want to switch on and off electrically, so you want the high voltage thing to be over there and your control mechanisms over here. And in such cases, you can use some isolation. Opto-isolators have a light-emitting diode connected to basically some sort of transistor that's light-sensitive, or sometimes this will be a light-sensitive resistor. The advantage of these is that they're pretty fast, although they're limited in terms of the amount of current they can carry. If you need to be pushing a lot of current, then you really have to go with a mechanical relay. Because they're mechanical, they can be more subject to failure potentially, and they're not going to be anywhere near as fast in terms of switching as something like an opto-isolator. If you're looking for an example of good design of power supplies, I recommend checking out this blog entry by Ken Sharif. I'll put a link to it in the description below. Ken did a teardown of Apple's iPhone charger and found that there are two PCBs. One of them is entirely responsible for high voltage stuff, and the other has a combination of high voltage and low voltage stuff. Notice the use of opto isolators and the fact that it also has some mechanisms built in to shut off if it gets too hot. Ken did a rough estimate of a bill of materials and came up with $4.66. That total may have changed since 2012 when this article was written, but it's probably in the ballpark, and I'll leave it as an exercise for the viewer to compare that to what Apple charges you. Okay, that's it for today. In the next lecture, we'll take a look at an old radio design called the All-American 5 that's extraordinarily dangerous, along with guitar amplifiers built along similar principles that are really, really extraordinarily dangerous and we'll take a look at something called the death capacitor.